Alright, alright, Headites. Welcome to Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Episode 29, the special solo cast edition. I am your host, Dr. Brandon Orlick, geologist. While you guys and gals have the pleasure of spending the next two hours with just me, your favorite EHHMP host, my two regular co hosts did want to stop by real quick. Alright, so here comes Mr. Dave Z. Dave, how about a uh, quick pep talk for my first solo endeavor? Get this through your head, you Jew motherfucker, you! Wow! What the hell was that? Woo! Alright, let's move on. Oh, everyone, everyone, rise. Get on your feet, get on your feet. Christian's coming. I see him entering the studio. What'd you think of the welcome, see? Suck my Canadian balls! Well, that was rude. BP! BP in the house. Everybody, BP's here. BP, say something to your fans. What dost thou want? Wouldst thou like the taste of butter? A pretty dress? Wouldst thou like to live deliciously? Come on, BP, we get it. You were in a hit movie last year. It was 2016, it's now 2017, move on. Alright, that's it. Everybody out. Alright, so you may have noticed that I referred to myself as a doctor of geology earlier. Why did I do this? Well, because over the next few hours, we are going to discover some hidden gems. Yes, that is the theme of my show, hidden gems. We will dig deep, and we will have a rockin' good time. Get it? Rockin'? Rockin'? Anyone? Man, that's a Mr. Watson joke. Sorry, Watson. Yeah, big shout out to Mr. Watson. He really helped me uh, put this show together and get it organized. Really gave me a solid approach on how to uh, how to do this because I really was all over the place with this idea. So let's talk a little bit about what a hidden gem is. A hidden gem, by definition, is something that is extremely outstanding that not many people may know about. I also like to refer to these films as underrated, meaning to underestimate the extent, value, or importance of, and even under-talked about I'll use as a synonym for hidden gem slash underrated films. And when I say under-talked about, I'm talking maybe more about a film that could have been a successful hit. Maybe not, but usually I think more of something that is successful or that is well-received that doesn't seem to get much praise or seems to get lost in the shuffle. I know that sounds weird because I'm saying it was well-received, yet it's not getting much praise. Maybe it got a lot of praise when it first came out and then all of a sudden you know over the passage of time less and less people are talking about doesn't mean it's necessarily a hidden gem it's just under talked about on the flip side of that it could be a mainstream release that actually didn't do well at the box office but over time developed some sort of cult following or over time was more and more appreciated and still to this day is maybe grossly under talked about and we'll get to some of those films so you know I have a list of 10 honorable mentions which I will go over and then a list of 10 films that I just want to talk briefly about so basically 20 films the first 10 are what I call fringe films you know not necessarily horror films but definitely border on horror, more maybe crime, drama, thriller, mystery, films that should appeal to horror fans. And uh, then my main 10 are are strictly horror films. And I'll also go through the Facebook post, which I posted about three, four weeks ago. And we will go through some of the responses that people posted. And of course, I will rattle off the many, many films that appear on the list and maybe talk a little bit about the ones that appear at the top of the list, especially the number one film. I think first what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with my 10 honorable mentions, then we'll go into the Facebook post, and then I'll go into my 10 hidden gems. Now, these 20 films that I'm going to mention, along with the films that I mentioned from the Facebook post, are a fraction of films that can be considered underrated hidden gems. There are literally hundreds of films that I probably don't even know about, maybe even thousands that I don't even know about or haven't seen or had no desire to see that could be fantastic. So, in essence, there's a multitude of hidden gems out there and probably a never-ending supply of them. Because once we see as many films as we can, there's that many more that we haven't seen. Okay, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to start off by going over my honorable mentions. And these are in no particular order, but without further ado, let's get into this. So the first film I want to mention is from 2008. It's directed by F. Javier Gutierrez, and it's called Before the Fall. The world learns that a planet-killing meteorite will arrive in 72 hours. Now that brief description 
courtesy of IMDb is certainly enough to gain anyone's attention and, and make you want to see the film but the apocalypse story of this is is almost secondary there's a lot of depth to the story that's being told and a lot of great acting this is a Spanish film that I saw I'm not sure how long ago but I saw many years back and I absolutely loved it and I don't really hear anybody talking about it doesn't mean it's hidden doesn't mean you haven't seen it but to me it seems like it's under talked about so that's one that I recommend everyone check out the second film is the loved ones directed by Sean Byrne from 2009 Robin McLevy is a lead actress in this playing the character of Lola and she is absolutely fantastic and this is basically a film about Lola seeking revenge after a classmate turns down her prom invitation it's actually based on a real-life crime I read and I'm just gonna read a little excerpt that I found on that in March 2013 at Chester Crown Court judge Elgin Edwards described a sadistic torture murder as a reenactment of a scene from this film. During sentencing, the judge described the defendant, Gary George, as particularly liking the loved one. The victim, Andrew Nall, was brutally beaten, sustained 49 knife wounds, and had cleaning fluid found in his eyes. George was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 30 years. Damn! Robin McLevy also prepared for the role by researching serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer and watching such films as Misery, Natural Born Killers, and the works of Quentin Tarantino. Anyway, The Loved Ones is a fantastic film. I'm sure most of you have seen it by now. If you haven't, stop what you're doing, go watch it then come back and listen to the rest of the show. Next up is a film from 2008 called Otis. Now, while Otis is a really good film, it, it does play out more like a comedy. Actually, it is a comedy, not like a comedy. It's about a serial abductor slash killer who is looking for the perfect girl to reenact the prom with. And what happens is his latest victim escapes, gets in touch with her parents, and her parents and her brother wind up hunting down Otis because the police involved and the FBI involved are just absolute morons. Now, it is dark at times, but it is kind of a light-hearted horror comedy. But the thing that put this over the edge for me is something that's really hidden and needs to be talked about more is on the DVD, there is an alternate ending, which comes completely changes the tone of the film so I highly recommend checking out this film and also checking out the alternate ending on the DVD or Blu-ray edition definitely let me know which ending you prefer and if a sequel is warranted next up is a French film from 2009 called the hedgehog about a young girl named Paloma who's 11 years old who decides she's going to kill herself on her 12th birthday Paloma throughout the film meets a lot of different people who help her question her pessimism outlook on life. This is a great film, foreign film, obviously it's French. I highly recommend it. One I was lucky enough to see a while back. Don't even know if it's in print, but if you can find it, get it, watch it, love it. Okay, next film on the list, and I believe this is the fifth honorable mention, is a film called Ben X. It's a Belgium and Netherlands film. So uh, they're speaking, I believe, Flemish and Dutch, and it's from 2007. As an alternative to getting bullied at school, an autistic teenager retreats into the world of online role-playing games. Now this is a, a brutal yet touching and sad film. Ben X is based on the novel Nothing Was All He Said by Nick Balthazar, who also directed the film. Ben, our lead character, is a boy who suffers from Asperger's Syndrome. Now, the novel was inspired by the true story of a boy with autism who committed suicide because of bullying. So keep that in mind when watching this film. Definitely worth checking out, so I highly recommend Ben X. Next up, from Germany, 2008 a film called The Wave, a high school teacher's experiment to demonstrate to his students what life is like under a dictatorship spins horribly out of control when he forms a social unit with a life of its own. High school teacher Rainer Wegner is forced to teach a class on autocracy despite being an anarchist. When his students, third generation after the Second World War, do not believe that a dictatorship could be established in modern Germany, that's when he starts this experiment to demonstrate just how easily the masses can be manipulated. I'm not even going to go into this one. Check it out if you haven't. It's fantastic. All right, moving on. 13 Zametti. Now this is this is a French film from 2005. It was actually remade in 2010 as just 13 and it starred Jason Statham. I never saw the remake so I'm not going to attempt to 
criticize it or, or talk about it, but if you have an opportunity, seek out the original French version. It's about a young man named Sebastian. He decides to follow these instructions that are intended for someone else without knowing where they will take him. Something else he does not know is that there's this guy, Gerald, who's a cop, and he's tailing him. When he reaches his destination, Sebastian falls into a degenerate, clandestine world of mental chaos behind closed doors in which men gamble on the lives of other men. Check it out. Dave Z, this next one is for you. Picnic at Hanging Rock, 1975 Australian Peter Weir film. I love this film. It haunts me. It scares me. I've never read the book. I'd be interested in reading the book, but I have yet to do so. Picnic at Hanging Rock takes place during a rural summer picnic when a few students and a teacher from an Australian girls school vanish without a trace. Their absence frustrates and haunts the people left behind. I'll leave it at that. See it. Give feedback. I would love to hear what people think of this film. I mean, I know Dave and Christian and I have joked about covering it on the show, but it really isn't a horror film. But I, I would love to talk more about this film with people, and that's why I'm giving it an honorable mention. Next up on the list is a film called Husk. A group of friends stranded near a desolate cornfield find shelter in an old farmhouse, though they soon discover the dwelling is the center of a supernatural ritual. This is an American film from 2011. I love this film. There was a film from last year now called uh, Summer Camp, which kind of reminded me a little bit of this and I don't hear many people talk about this film but it's pretty well done and very original so definitely check it out. The tenth and final fringe film as I'll call it is a film called Time Lapse and this is from 2014 and my boy Derek sent me this. Thank you Derek. Three friends discover a mysterious machine that takes pictures 24 hours into the future and conspire to use it for personal gain until disturbing and dangerous images begin to develop. This film reminds me very much of the episode of the Twilight Zone called A Most Unusual Camera. Uh, this is a fantastic film, definitely more of a sci-fi film, but really well done. This marks the directorial debut of Bradley King and features three characters in one isolated location, so it's a very claustrophobic type film and a contained film as we like to call it these days. It stars the beautiful Danielle Panabaker, and the film has drawn comparison with Danny Boyle's 1994 film Shallow Grave, which I'm also a huge fan of so if you have seen Shallow Grave and you're a fan of that definitely check out Time Lapse if you haven't checked out either one check out both. Okay, let's get into the Facebook poll and some of the responses we got from the listeners and the members of the group page. Okay, so Aaron Jim was the first one who started us off with a first comment of Satan's little helper, followed by three exclamation points. To which Mr. Watson replied, watched this on my first date with Kayla to see if she was all about that Mr. Watson. Here we are two years later, I'm drunk on the couch, and I have no idea where she is. Hope she's okay. Alright, that's um alarming. I have received word though that Kayla is in fact okay and Watson is no longer drunk. Okay, then we have the Ram Man posting the Mephisto Waltz, a film I actually haven't seen. He claims the film isn't as good as the book, which seems to be the case with most films based off of uh, books. He says it's still a decent watch. He also added The Devil Rides Out. He says this film is not necessarily hidden, but he rarely hears anyone cover it and it's easily one of Christopher Lee's best films. Again, another film I haven't seen. I've heard of it, haven't seen it. Xavier West agrees with the Ram Man, stating it is his favorite Christopher Lee film and he wishes more podcasts would cover it. Then we have a bunch of people adding more and more films. I'll go through this whole list. I come upon a post by Michael Watkins and he posts about Splinter. He says, I love Splinter. It's almost a perfect movie in my opinion. Small but great cast, great location, great creature effects, genuine tension, not too long, not too short. I can't think of anything to dislike about it. This is a film I can't tell you how long I've been putting off watching. Not for any particular reason, I just haven't gotten to watch it yet, so probably very soon. Then we have Sam Edwards who posts Pin. He says it's not a movie that's often discussed, it's an awesome film. I agree with him. Pin often comes up in conversations when I'm talking with buddies of mine about underrated horror films, so it's probably the most mentioned underrated horror film that I've heard, yet it's still underrated because it's not talked about enough. Amanda W. I added Spring. I didn't hear anything about it, saw it pop up on Amazon Prime one day and checked it out. Great acting and just a good story. I found this post amusing because Spring was actually my number one film of 2015 and that's a perfect example of a film that I gave such high praise to. Granted, you know, I'm not, you know, a famous critic or anything, but I gave high praise to was all about this film and yet here we are one plus years later and it sort of got lost in the shuffle and popped up on an underrated, underappreciated hidden gem list. 
list. So thank you, Amanda W. If any of you haven't seen this film, check it out. It's phenomenal. I loved it. That's why I chose it as my number one. Moving on down the list, Jonathan Watkins added Dario Argento's Sleepless, which... I love, and I definitely agree, that, that is an underrated film. Probably, I don't want to say it's his last great film. I don't know if it's a great film, but it's probably the last highly rated film that he made, in my opinion. Then we get The Monster Squad being added by Mike Schlegel. He added Monster Squad and comments that it's criminally underrated, completely badass movie. I will kick anyone who disagrees in the nards. <laughs> Wolfman's got nards! To which Michael Watkins replied... I don't agree that it's underrated. I think pretty much everyone recognizes how awesome Monster Squad is. Well, except my nephew. I was all excited to show him the movie, and they had already played it as daycare, but he likes bubble guppies, so what the hell does he know? <laughs> You know, that's, and that's interesting. Here we have an argument where, not an argument, but a friendly debate where one person sees the Monster Squad as criminally underrated, where someone else feels like it's so well known that how can it be underrated? And maybe it's just because of the fact that it's an older movie. We've gone through a long period of time where maybe people haven't talked about it. People have always loved it, but if you're not talking about it, it becomes somewhat hidden. So I think that, again, plays into this loose definition that I'm, I'm playing with of hidden gem slash underrated slash under talked about film sean thompson finished up the posts with pretty loose idea of underrated i mean who in the fandom of horror hasn't already heard of these films and if you haven't heard and seen them then it doesn't apply well that's true that's why i gave these multiple definitions because chances are with the types of horror fans that we all are we've heard of most of these films even if we haven't seen them but if you haven't heard of them then by definition, it is, without a doubt, a hidden gem, so I think that certainly applies. And if you haven't seen them, then again, it could fall into the category of being something that's under-talked about. And it doesn't have to be necessarily you, the viewer, who has, isn't talking about it. It could be other people who have seen it who loved it, or maybe didn't love it, who aren't talking about it. You know, without other people talking about these films, we're not going to discover them. I know I rely on updates from tons of different people to know what's going on, what's coming out, what's good, what's not, what am I missing, what's a hidden gem from this decade or from this year. You know, I don't spend hours researching online. I rely on others to do that, and they do it, and man, I've discovered so many great films thanks to these people and thanks to so many people in the, our group in the 22 shots group just all over all over youtube so yeah i want to thank everyone for posting now i'm going to kind of quickly go through the list of films there's a bunch i was shocked to see how many people posted on here and i'm just going to sort of read through the films these first 20 30 films that i'm going to read off are just films that got kind of one or two votes but if they got a vote they're getting read off okay nightmare detective 13 game of death 5150 elms way landmine goes clear yeah, JP. The Caller. Good pick. Lightning Bug. Blood Creek. Hell's Ground. The Corpse Vanishes. Spring. Sleepless. Spookies. Colossus. Final Exam. Summer of Fear. Seven Nights of Darkness. Dust Devil. Rituals. Picnic at Hanging Rock. Day of the Beast. Pin. Doghouse. Martin. Great pick. Martin, definitely George Romero's most underrated film and might be one of the most underrated horror films. I'm not going to be talking much about this one, but it's a vampire film, or is it? Definitely check it out, though. Don't Be Afraid of the Dark from 1973, Santa's Slay, Punishment Park, which I believe is extremely difficult to find, The Mephisto Waltz, which I talked about a little bit earlier from The Ram Man, The Affix, The Shrine, Trailer Park of Terror, Monster Squad, Bone Tomahawk, Red, White, and Blue, Coherence, The Jacket, The Devil Rides Out, Poughkeepsie Tapes, Slither, Christmas Evil, The Descent, Taurus Trap, Lovely Molly, Jason X, The Changeling, The Ninth Gate, Deathgasm, Nightbreed, Pontypool. All great picks. And now I'm going to just quickly go over the top five or six vote getters. And Satan's Little Helper was number six. Clive Barker's Lord of Illusion, interestingly enough, was number five. And I always felt like, even though when we reviewed it on the show, it was my first time seeing it, like this was a film that was, if anything, overrated. Because I've always heard good things about it. And even though I enjoyed it, I always felt like there were people that didn't. And, or didn't think as highly as the majority did. But it shows up at number five on the underrated list. Triangle. That's a 
psychological mind fuck a great film it takes place on a boat that's for you moods cube cube is an excellent excellent movie to show up on this list at number three you know i think when i first saw this film i thought of it as an okay film i enjoyed it but i think it's really gained this sort of status as time has gone on as sort of like a, a great sci-fi slash horror film and it wasn't necessarily received that way when it first came out splinter got the second most votes and like i said i still haven't seen splinter i'm certainly going to very soon and the number one vote getter with 31 votes frailty now frailty was bill paxton's directorial debut starring bill paxton and matthew mcconaughey and powers booth and it's a phenomenal film i always thought highly of this film from the first time i saw it when it came out so i never viewed it as an underrated film the fact that so many people do is interesting i i guess you know people discovered it later on so in in that sense if somebody's first discovering this film now it would be the definition of a hidden gem for me i saw it when it first came out so i've always loved it and i guess in a way it's my fault for not getting the word out there enough that frailty is a phenomenal film that i everyone should see so i'm gonna do that frailty is a phenomenal film everyone should see it go out and buy it just do it do it just do it all right so that's gonna conclude the facebook poll and the facebook responses we got thank you everyone for participating okay it's now time to get into the top 10 list of horror films that i feel are underrated what i'm going to do is i'm going to start with number 10 and work down to number one the first nine films are really in no particular order my number one pick is a film i'm going to spend a few extra minutes talking about but most of these films i'm just going to spend a brief two three four minutes talking about if that long and then we'll move on to the next one because we we still have a lot more to cover. Coming in at number 10 is The Dead Zone from 1983, directed by David Cronenberg, based on the novel by Stephen King. And this one, of course, is about a man who awakens from a coma after five years to discover he has psychic detective abilities. Christopher Walken stars as Johnny and steals the film, in my opinion. Great cast and storytelling, a complete 180 from the films that Cronenberg was doing and would go on to do. To me, this might be Stephen King's most underrated movie adaptation. I think very highly of the works of Mr. King and all the classics that he's written, and The Dead Zone, to me, deserves to be considered in the same vein as The Shining when it comes to King's works and Cronenberg's earlier and later classics that would follow. I love a story with real character depth that holds up even in today's age. The story is scary, heartbreaking, and completely relevant to the world we live in. A TV series of The Dead Zone starring Anthony Michael Hall was eventually done and was actually really quite entertaining but never really captured the the darkness that the original film does. I mean, this is a downbeat, depressing film. Man, with everything going on in today's society, is it ever relevant? I mean, it's it's creepy how we can watch this film and feel like we're watching something that might have been made as a social commentary on the world we live in today. So coming in at number 10, that was The Dead Zone. Coming in at number 9, we have The Carrier from 1988. Let me read you a quick description from The Bee on this one. The main character is stricken with a horrible disease, but it doesn't affect him. It spreads to every inanimate object that he touches, and then if another person touches the object, they are dissolved into it. No one knows that Jake is the carrier except him. This brings about the red objects that specify every object that he has touched, as discovered by the community with cats. They use cats to test inanimate objects for the disease, and they cover themselves in garbage bags to protect themselves. Now that's a crazy description, but a fitting description, because this film is bonkers and plays on religious fanaticism versus scientific rationale. It's a community in crisis that becomes divided, and war breaks out. It's a cult film worth seeking out and definitely worth checking out. It's a very low budget film, but possesses so much charm. I actually discovered this film doing my 100 obscure horror movie challenge. If it wasn't for that list, I never would have even known about this film, let alone seen it and discovered this odd gems. I had to seek out an old VHS copy off of eBay. This was very tough to come by. I'm not even sure if it has a DVD release. It might have one from Code Red. Um, don't take my word for that. Look into it. I bought an old used VHS copy on eBay that I found for cheap, but even a lot of the VHSs were going for insane prices. Do what you have to do to seek it out. I actually gave away the VHS copy to a friend to check out, so hopefully she enjoyed it as much as I did. All right, coming in at number eight from 1985, Hard Rock Zombies. A hard rock band travels to a tiny remote 
town to perform, inhabited by hicks, rubes, werewolves, murderous dwarfs, sex perverts, and Hitler, the town is a strange place, but that doesn't stop the band's lead singer from falling in love with a local girl named Cassie. After Nazi sex perverts killed the band to satisfy their lust, Cassie calls on the rockers back from the grave to save her, the town, and maybe even the world. Alright, now, that description there should have you running to find this film and check it out. This was originally meant to only be about a 20 minute long film and used as the feature movie in American Drive-In from 1985, which is a film by the same director. But at some point during the production, the decision was made to invest more money and come out with two full length feature films instead of just one. This is the definition of a WTF film. Again, it's one I discovered on my 100 obscure horror movie list and I'm so thankful that I did because I fell in love with it instantly. The soundtrack gets embedded in your mind and the images displayed are certainly going nowhere anytime soon. For those who have seen it, let me just say self-devouring midget. And for those of you who haven't seen it, let me add self devouring midget that's right you heard me self devouring midget that's enough said hard rock zombies comes in at number eight on my hidden gems list coming in at number seven on the list is a film from 1977 called the creeper aka rituals this film stars Hal Holbrook and is about five doctors on a wilderness outing that are stalked by disfigured crazed killers. This film is the last of the films from the 100 obscure movie list challenge that I did that I'm going to talk about on this show but it's among one of my favorites from that list and there were a lot of good ones on it but this one stuck with me. It's to me it was a perfect mix of The Hills Have Eyes and Deliverance. Great acting, great dialogue, from what I've read, great cinematography, although the copy that I saw was on YouTube and it was really, really poor quality. I was so engaged by the story itself that I was able to, to make it through, even though it really was almost unwatchable. This film would definitely benefit from a quality Blu-ray treatment. Uh, like I said, it stars Hal Holbrook. It's an all-male cast. It's five male doctors. There's actually no female characters in this film. I wonder if that might have to do with why horror fans may be haven't discovered this one. I mean, it's it's not really a slasher. It's more of a survival adventure horror. You really feel the sense of dread and the character's experience in this film. You, you feel their struggle. You feel the exhaustion that they go through. It's really well done. I mean, these are really good actors in this film. It has an openly gay character, which I guess... Um, I mean, I maybe wasn't one of the originals, but this film was made in 1976. Didn't come out till 77, 78, but... This film was made, you know, we're talking 40 years ago, and it has a lot of interesting dialogue and is definitely worth checking out. I know Code Red put out a DVD release of this. I'm not sure if you could even still find it. I'm sure the picture quality is not that good, but this is a film that honestly needs to be sought out, needs to be seen, and really needs an upgrade when it comes to physical media. Yep, so that's number seven, Rituals, a.k.a. The Creeper, or The Creeper, a.k.a. Rituals, however you prefer to call it, and that's from 1977. Okay, so now we're going to move on to number six. And for number six, I have Pieces of Talent from 2014. Pieces of Talent is a perfect example of a well-received, regarded film that sort of... I don't want to say fell into obscurity because it's only been two years, but I think it's just a natural occurrence with the passage of time that, you know, once you see a great film now, you know, the next year comes, you start seeing more great films, and we kind of don't necessarily talk about the films that we just saw the year before or two years before. Same thing with, like, The Battery from 2013, one of the best films I've seen of this millennia, horror films, and still criminally underrated. Uh, but Pieces of Talent is about Charlotte, who is an aspiring actress looking for her big break, and David, who is a wannabe filmmaker, looking for a project. Will their chance encounter evolve into a beneficial collaboration? As Charlotte tries to pique David's interest in casting her for his next project, she won't believe what sort of film he's in the process of making. This film was directed by Joe Stauffer, written by David Long and Joe Stauffer, and, and stars uh, Christy Ray and David Long. Christy Ray did a phenomenal job in the lead here as Charlotte. What a wonderful film, and I know Joe Stoffer had planned to do a sequel, but really got screwed over. I remember he posted a uh, YouTube video or a Facebook message talking about the negative experience he had with, tr with trying to get funding going for the sequel, and it's unfortunate because he's a talented, talented writer, director, and a sequel to this would have been really well received from all fans of, uh, of the first one. I mean, 
I'm a huge fan of it. It made my top 10. It was my, I believe, number 7 of 2014, maybe number 6. And I know it made a lot of people's number 1. So I would love to eventually see a sequel to this. Yeah, so Pieces of Talent 2014. I know you've probably all heard of it. If you haven't seen it, do so. Seek out a copy. I know they've released some Blu-rays. I don't know if there's any still in stock, but if not, see if you can get your hands on a DVD copy because it's a fantastic film that really, really deserves all the recognition in the world. Okay, so that's number six. All right, so let's take a little break and just shoot the shit for a little bit. Take a little break before we get into the top five films that I have on my list. Oh, Dave's back. Dave. What do you think of this show so far? Top notch, top notch. Thank you, Dave. Now, before we get back into it, I hope you guys are enjoying the show. I hope you're discovering a few films that either you haven't heard of or haven't seen, or maybe you have seen them and you just remember that they're great, just like I did when I discovered them for the first time. Uh, shout out to Dave, shout out to Christian, shout out to Mr. Watson. Man, you make these solo casts sound effortless because this is no easy task. I am bored of listening to my own voice. Hopefully, you guys aren't. <laughs> Why don't we switch it up a little bit? Let's get into the top five, and let's uh, do a little trailer before each one. All right, here comes number five. Killing and bringing you back. That's how he connects. All right, what you just heard was a condensed version of the trailer for the 2014 film Come Back to Me, directed by Paul Layden and based on the book called The Resurrectionist. Now, this film, I'm guilty, it didn't even make my top 20 list or top 25 list that year, but man, what a film. This film is about a young couple, Sarah, Josh, who live in the suburbs, who start to suffer blackouts and odd dreams after a new neighbor by the name of Dale moves in. And Dale is a character played by the actor Nathan Kias, and he is terrific in this. You learn about Dale pretty early on is that as a teenager, he witnessed his mother being killed by his father. And then he witnesses his father being killed by the police. So he is clearly very screwed up. And once he moves in next door, this couple, particularly Sarah, starts experiencing these vivid dreams of herself being murdered only to wake up and everything's okay. The film is really quite disturbing and takes some really shocking twists and turns and goes somewhere where you, you don't think it's going to go. I, I kind of want to be cryptic with this because I don't want to spoil this. And it has one of the most dark and disturbing endings I've seen in a long time. And that's why this film is on my list. I, I really don't want to say much about this film except to see it. It's, again, a, a newer film from 2014. Doesn't run that long, I believe. Yeah, it's, it's like an 85-minute film. It's really worth seeking out. I believe it's still up on Netflix. So if you get an opportunity, check out Come Back to Me. That's uh, my number five film. Number four on the list will not feature a trailer ahead of time since it's a Spanish film and the trailer is in Spanish. It is a 2011 mystery thriller slash horror film from director Andy Baez, most notably known for the Netflix show Narcos. It is The Hidden Face. It's about a Spanish orchestra conductor who deals with the mysterious disappearance of his girlfriend. The film is basically dealing with three characters, Adrian, our male lead, and of course, Belen, the girlfriend who disappears, and Fabiana, the new girl that Adrian meets and falls for when he believes that Bellin has actually disappeared, when in fact what has actually happened is Bellin was playing a joke on Adrian and was hiding in a secret room in the house. It was a secret room that used to hide former Nazi SS officers. The German lady who owned the house showed it to Bellin and she was hiding in there to surprise Adrian and basically locked herself in there. Basically what happens is later on in the story, Fabiana discovers that Bellin is still in the house and actually in the walls, but is kind of torn on what to do because she's falling for Adrian. And so it becomes almost like a, 
I love Triangle, and it's very claustrophobic because Bellin's struggling. She's trapped in there. She's she's low on food and water, and and Adrian's all torn up. What happened to Bellin? And Fabiana's all torn up about whether or not to let Bellin out. What this means for her and and Adrian. It sounds almost like a, a romance movie, but it's it's very dark and it's got a lot of cool twists to it, and very well shot and well acted and two beautiful lead actresses so the hidden face also known as la cara occulta comes in at number four be sure and check this one out great film hey. 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 Amir is bringing glory to dinner Amir is a total jackass <laughs> Everyone else still not have service. I got zero. No. On the news, you know, they're talking about the comet. Yeah, yeah. Wheeler's awesome. comet. After it passed, people get lost. They would end up in the wrong home. Wow. And they keep telling people that this can happen. The chicken tastes like right. tuna. It must be comet. Miller's comet. <laughs> the whole neighborhood is out of power, uh, except for a house about two blocks up. <laughs> what the hell is that? Mike, Kevin. is that the door locked? I'll, say, I'll check it. Baby, stay away from the door. door. I can't stand this. I'm going to go see what's going on. I'm sorry, but I'm going. Us. See that? Oh, Jesus. my God. This is bad. This is really Wait, bad. Wait, what's the box? That was at the other house. Oh, oh my God. God. Baby, what did you see? Hugh, what, what did you see? What did you see? We don't even belong here. Everybody knew about we this. Thought he you told knew. us. Thought you he knew. told us. Everybody told knew about you. this except me. We have to just get through the night, okay? We are not from this house. We are visitors. I'm crossing all kinds of boundaries. I don't want to be stuck here. What is going on? Okay, so the trailer you just heard is from the 2013 sci-fi thriller with horror elements called Coherence. It is directed by James Ward Burkett, and it's about a group of friends who gather for a dinner party on an evening when a comet is passing overhead, and strange things soon begin to happen. Now, this is a real thought-provoking, mysterious film. I saw it did pop up on the list, as you as you might have heard when I mentioned it earlier. Not a lot of votes, which means not a lot of people obviously have seen it which is a shame because this is as good as low budget horror mystery thrillers can get this film was made on a budget of i believe 50,000 and it was stemmed from the idea that the director wanted to make a film in one location and it basically takes place is around the dinner table the whole time the film is heavy and rich with dialogue that was mostly improvised and there was only i believe 5 crew members that actually worked on this film in an interview director Burkett says for about a year all I did was make charts and maps and drew diagrams of houses arrows pointing where everyone was going trying to keep track of different iterations months and months of tracking fractured realities looking up what actual scientists believe about the nature of reality Schrodinger's cat and all that it was research but despite all the graphs and charts I think our whole idea was that it has to be character based. We want the logic of our internal rules to be sound and we wanted it to be something people could watch 12 times and still discover a new layer. Yeah, so basically this is a complicated film with a lot of depth. For me to sit here and try to explain it and get into it wouldn't do it justice at all. It would be a great film to cover on the podcast regularly, but I would need Christian and Dave with me to bounce ideas off of. I don't really want to go much into the film itself because the less you know about this, the better. But it was shot in a really short period of time. I believe it was only a couple of weeks that it was shot in. I believe it was shot in the director's own house. So really a terrific film. If you've seen it, speak up about it because more people need to see this film. I think it's available on DVD. I'm not sure if it has a Blu-ray release, but definitely check out Coherence from 2013. That was number three. Coming up is the number two. Only the sweet ones. Only the young ones will do. Silence is the sound of madness. Kidnapped, 
from reality. Hi. Get out! Schoolgirl in chains. Imprisoned in a cellar of terror. We're being used as the toys or playmates. Subjected to the twisted and tormented needs of two insane brothers. Tired of the door, Jim. All your clothes, and I'll examine you. John, listen, why, why don't we play custom rubbers, okay? No, I want to okay. operate. <laughs> no, John! Sexual fantasies become the nightmares of reality as they feed their insatiable appetite. <laughs> How long are you going to keep us here? I don't know! What are they going to do with us? You'll see. Why do you meet Mama? A madhouse. Yet in these rooms, Still another lives and waits. Let me go, Frank. Don't make me go back to the cellar, Frank. I promise. No! Don't tell me to go back! I'll keep you in the cellar. Don't you think it's about time I met your mother? Abducted, violated, and the worst was yet to come. Schoolgirls in Chains. Okay, if you haven't already figured it out, number two is Schoolgirls in Chains from 1973. Directed by Donald Jones. Two deranged brothers who are under the domineering influence of their crazed mother kidnap young girls and keep them captive in chains in their basement where they subject them to depraved games that often end in torture and murder. Now the cover art for this, while awesome, can be very misleading. It almost makes it look like it's a monster keeping these women all chained and bound in a dungeon and it seems like it's just a, a sex and depravity movie. And while it is depraved in a way, I feel like there's a lot of depth to this film. I feel like this film is very much inspired by Psycho. I do feel like it definitely is is Grindhouse film, but I feel like depth that this film goes to in terms of character development, especially among our two antagonists, is done so well that this film really rises above that Grindhouse label. And that's why I put it in at my number two pick. I've been t speaking highly of this film ever since I first saw it, and it's been, it's been a while now, and I always tell people to check this one out. It's one of the films that I feel is extremely underrated. From what I've read, it's actually based on an actual incident. I, I believe it was just a missing girl whose car was found abandoned. I know that sounds weird because then they make up this whole story afterwards because that's how the film starts. You know, they they really just, I guess, went with that basic idea and created a whole story of what might have happened and this is what they came up with. And it is it is depraved and disturbing and tough to watch at times, but it's also heartbreaking and tough to watch at times. Without saying too much, the mother character is critical in ultimately why this story takes place and it's really very psycho-esque and very heartbreaking. So yeah, Schoolgirls and Chains, and that came out in 1973. That's a pretty decent rating on IMDb, 5.3. Runs about an hour and 20 minutes long. Not a not a long film at all. I believe these were mostly theater and stage actors and actresses that were used. I mean, there were some names, I believe, in this, but I think it was mostly local actors used. Yeah, low budget, $45,000 budget. The film debut of Mary Lynn Ross, it says here. Yeah, there's really not much on this film in terms of detail. I actually haven't explored if the DVD I own has any special features. Probably should have done that before the show. Oh well, you don't want to hear me ramble on about this too long. All I'll say is check it out. It's a very misleading title and cover art in the sense that you feel that it's just a big sleaze fest when in fact it is sleazy, but there's there's depth to the story, so... Interestingly enough, this film did not make the Video Nasties list, but did make the DPP's Section 3 list. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's where I first heard about it, was watching the two-volume Video Nasties documentary, and the second volume was, of course, on the Section 3 titles. I found, in my opinion, that the Section 3 list has far more better titles than the original Video Nasties list. Schoolgirls in Chains, number two. The moment has arrived. Number one, I'm going to play the trailer. We're going to talk for a few minutes about it, and then we're going to flip the script on this show.
Captain Cacho, Benson. In order for life to have appeared spontaneously on Earth, there first had to be hundreds of millions of protein molecules of the ninth configuration. Vincent. But given the size of the planet Earth, do you know how long it would take for just one of these protein molecules to appear entirely by chance? Vincent. Roughly 10 to the 243rd power billions of years. And I find that far, far more fantastic than simply believing in a God. Okay, so clearly, by now you figured out, number one, the most underrated horror film of all time, in my opinion, is William Peter Blatty's The Ninth Configuration. He wrote the book, he wrote the screenplay, and he directed it. And it's one of only two films he directed. He also directed Exorcist 3, which obviously just recently got a new Scream uh, Factory release with the Legion cut, which he obviously also directed. He's most notably known, of course, for writing The Exorcist, but to me... This is my favorite Blatty film. I absolutely love this film. It stars Stacey Keach and Scott Wilson. Both of them are fucking amazing. Let me just read a list of all the other stars that appear in this film. We got Jason Miller, not Dick Miller, Christian, Ed Flanders, Neville Brand, George DeCenzo, Moses Gunn, Robert Loja, Joe Spinell, and Tommy motherfucking Atkins. Now, when I recently met Tom Atkins at a convention, I brought this film up to him, and he looked at me like I was crazy. I guess nobody ever brings this film up to him, so it's, it's even a hidden gem for him. And he talked with me a while about it and about the filming of it and how crazy it was they shot in Budapest. And uh, he was telling me some crazy stories. The original lead actors were fired for destroying the hotel room. It was chaos. But ultimately, it led to Stacey Keach being brought in and Scott Wilson being brought in. They are the main bright spots of the film. They are a majority of the film. The story really revolves around their relationship. The film is about a new commanding officer, who's played by Stacey Keach, arriving at a remote castle serving as an insane asylum for crazy and AWOL U.S. Army soldiers, where he attempts to rehabilitate them by allowing them to live out their fantasies. And often their fantasies are rather crazy. I know, um, I almost said <laughs> Dick Miller. Jason Miller's character is putting on a performance of Hamlet using only dogs. Like, it's it's absolutely batshit. But Scott Wilson is an astronaut who's lost his way, lost all faith in, in God, doesn't even believe in God. And there's a lot of heavy dialogue between him and Stacey Keach's character. And it's really driven by their performances. And it's nice to see guys like Robert Loja and Joe Spinell and Tom Atkins, Neville Brand, all these other guys show up and it's just, it's a horror fan's dream cast is what it is, seeing all these amazing actors come together to make such an amazing film. This film has a really horrific scene that takes place in a bar towards the end of the film, but it relies very heavily on surreal and nightmarish imagery and flashbacks of war, perils and dangers and the loss that people suffered during war, and it's a very dialogue-heavy film dialogue driven film and just some great performances in here with a lot of twists in it and it's like every other film on this list like any film really it's best to go in not knowing much now i would recommend buying this film and watching it with subtitles because there's so much dialogue going on that sometimes you miss something it's got a lot of comedy in it but it's also got a lot of depth into it i adore this film this is one of my favorite films period let alone my favorite underrated film and i rarely ever hear anyone talk about it. I know Scott Wilson will be making an appearance at Monster Mania in March. I will be going down there to meet him to hopefully get him to sign a ninth configuration poster. And now I've mentioned conventions twice in the last minute or so, so I'm going to stop talking about that. Hint, hint. Just kidding. Christian and Dave will get that little inside joke. Uh, yeah, so ninth configuration, get on it. It has a beautiful Blu-ray DVD release. Buy it, check it out, Love it. Got no other choice. I actually sent a copy of this to the 22 Shots guys to review a while back, and they thought very highly of it as well, so check it out. Do it! Just...
do it! That's gonna do it. While my original intent was to break down each of these films I had chosen into a little bit more detail, ultimately what happened was I picked too many. 20 was a lot to pick. Then we had the Facebook response, which was overwhelmingly successful. Thank you again to everyone who participated. And ultimately, I felt like it would be better to just at least rattle off the 60, 70 total films that I did and at least allow everyone out there listening to be exposed to them. Now, if any of you are interested, I will issue you a challenge in which I'd like you to watch the 20 films that I recommend and let me know what your thoughts are on my list. Now, I could have picked 20 different films just as easily, but I chose these 20. These 20 left a lasting impression on me, and I'm glad I chose them. This was a perfect format for me to highlight some of my favorite, more obscure films. So yeah, check them out. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you think you'd be interested in hearing uh, some mini-reviews on future episodes of Exploding Heads, because that might be a future segment I do where I do a mini-review of a hidden gem. You know, maybe like a 5-10 minute where I can actually outline the film and kind of go into more detail about plot points and stuff. Minus spoilers, of course. We're not done here, but we're going to take a little break. I'm going to be back. Got a little song to sing for Dave Z, and then we're going to flip the script on this. Back to work, fool! Okay, so we're back, and before we go into our next topic of discussion, I have a little treat for all our listeners. I have a little song that I'm dedicating to the one, the only, Mr. Dave Z. Now, for all you listeners who have been with us since the beginning, even if you haven't been with us since the beginning, you know that Dave recently sung a Black Phillip song for me. Christian, of course, has been Ice Crappuccino for, I don't know how long, too long. Too long, yeah. But I decided that I'm going to sing a song I wrote called Rocky Don't Breathe. And it's dedicated to Mr. Dave Z. And it's set to the music of Madonna's Papa Don't Preach. All right, here we go. Ready? Rocky Don't Breathe. She's so lovable. Rocky Don't Breathe. She's in trouble. Cause he's made up his mind. He's blind. And he's wanting your baby. So... What'd you think of verse 1? I decided to switch up the lyrics a little bit for verse 2 and incorporate Mr. Z into the actual song. Verse 2 goes like this. Dave Z, don't breathe. I'll outrace ya. Dave Z, don't breathe. I'm gonna baste ya. And I've made up my mind. I ain't blind, but you're having my baby. There you have it. That was a complete and total embarrassment. I apologize, but I had to do it. I've been promising a song for a while. I can't sing, I know. Not even sure I can write based on these lyrics, but I did the best I could, so fuck all y'all if you don't like it. That's for you, Dave. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the complete opposite of what we've been discussing for the first 45 minutes or an hour or so. I haven't edited, edited it, edited it, edited it yet. Wow, that's hard to say. I have to edit the show. I'm going to edit the show down. But when I say it really fast, I haven't edited it. There's too many. I think I'm stroking out. I've been sitting in front of the computer for like seven hours. This is so much harder than I thought. Like I was saying or haven't said, we are going to flip the script and talk about overrated, overhyped films. Okay, so overrated by definition is to have a higher opinion of something than is deserved. But since it's your opinion, who decides what praise or lack thereof it deserves? You know, it's not like we're dealing with actual facts here where you can say this is hard science. We can look into it and say, hey, that's overrated. You know, I say X is the greatest basketball player of all time when X's stats clearly show that he is not the greatest basketball player of all time. So I like to actually switch it up and instead of using the word overrated use the term overhyped and overhyped is to make exaggerated claims about product or an idea or an event or in this case a film and to publicize or promote excessively and overhyping a film definitely exists i mean it's the job of studios and filmmakers you know it it doesn't even have to be a studio film if i'm making a small independent film for a thousand bucks i'm gonna hype it up and try and sell it because i want people to see it i want people to buy it Overhyping a film does exist but i always try to go into each film with zero expectations off of what i've heard i've always tried to tell people no matter what i think of a film 
you need to check it out for yourself, whether I love it or hate it, because it's all subjective, it's all opinion, there's no facts here. I can tell you Halloween is the greatest movie of all time, you can tell me Halloween is the worst movie of all time. I can tell you why Halloween is the greatest movie of all time, you can give me some ideas as to why it's the worst movie of all time. And you know what? Even though I might be able to argue with you and tell you, you know, your thoughts are stupid, they're your thoughts, they're your opinions, you believe them, so it's true for you. So anyway, I put a poll up on the Facebook group, and I said, what are the most overrated or overhyped horror films in your opinion? And then I told them to add as many options as they wanted, and to use the comment section to tell me why they thought said movie is overrated or overhyped. And we got an overwhelming amount of movies. Now, I'm going to breeze through these much like I did with the hidden gem list. Once we get to, I'll stop and talk about a few of these, but once we get to, you know, the meat and potatoes, the ones that got double digit votes and our number one film actually got over 60 votes, we'll get into discussion a little bit about that. The first film on the list is not without its controversy, and that is Night of the Living Dead, the original. Now, I know what you're thinking. To me, it's a 10 out of 10, so how can this be overrated or overhyped? I don't think it's overrated. I don't even think it's overhyped, but I could see how somebody can just enjoy this film, think it's a good film, or not enjoy this film. Maybe they don't like black and white films. That's fine. Maybe they don't like zombie films. Maybe they find it dated, but it's very hyped up, especially being one of the original zombie films and being such an iconic film for its time in the late 60s by George Romero. So I can see why people might say, hey, I love Night of the Living Dead, but it's definitely overhyped. So I think that's where we're going when, when people say, oh, it's overhyped. But again, still a great film. All right, next we have Shaun of the Dead, which was edited by my boy Zach, who I think edited it simply because I made the comment to him that nobody had edited Shaun of the Dead, yet everyone's always talking about how Shaun of the Dead is overrated. And I think that falls into the, the category that they used that film to compare with every other film that followed after that was closely like it. From the producers of Shaun of the Dead, from the directors, almost as funny as Shaun of the Dead, not since Shaun of the Dead. And they do it today, you know, from the creators of Paranormal Activity, from the producers of Insidious, from the, the craft service manager of Annabelle. You know, they do this to get people to buy tickets. You hear big names are associated with the film. Just associated. They might not have done much, but they're associated with the film, and you're going to go see it. It's like these Eli Roth Presents or Guillermo del Toro Presents. More likely to go see it if you know a big name is getting paid to say go see it. All right, next we have Maniac Cop. Not sure if that came from Dave or not, but I try not to aggravate him. Next we have Terror Train, which... Man, I, you know, I don't want to say it's overrated or overhyped. I didn't enjoy it the second time as much as I did the first, but I won't even say the second time, this last time as much as I did the previous times I had. But since getting into podcasting, I'm trying to look at things through such a critical eye that I think sometimes I'm zapping the enjoyment factor out of, out of the films because I'm seeing like, oh man, that could have been so much better if they'd done this, if they'd done that. Anyway, let's get through these films. This is a lot. Uh, the Sacrament. That might be another Dave Z one. Halloween actually shows up with two votes. Kill List, which is interesting considering Kill List shows up on a lot of underrated lists. Suspiria, Halloween H2O, Don't Breathe, promise I didn't add that. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Night of the Hunter, Cella Tersica, Evil Dead, Aliens, Carrie, Return of the Living Dead, Event Horizon, Silence of the Lambs. Silence? Shame on you. I have to call you people out. Sean Moriarty, Chris Lax, Chris Huddleston, and David Smith. Shame on you guys. Nah, it's all cool. Anyone who knows me knows Silence of the Lambs is my favorite horror movie of all time, if we're categorizing it as horror. Annabelle. Hush. Black Christmas. Hey, I see Dave's vote in there. Dave's vote is definitely in there. Poltergeist. Let the right one in. The original Hills Have Eyes. Army of Darkness, Hellraiser, that's an interesting one because we're going to be covering the Hellraiser trilogy, the first three films, on episode 30, and as much as I still won't commit to saying overrated, this has always been a franchise that I haven't enjoyed as much as as others have. Maybe I'm just scared to say I feel a film is overrated because I don't want to give it that label, but I'm looking forward to re-watching these films and, and giving my thoughts on them now because it, it's been a while since I've watched them. I've just never been the biggest fan of, of the Hellraiser series. There's a few good ones sprinkled in there. Obviously, the first two are the best ones. To watch them again for review purposes will be interesting to see where, uh, where ratings come in. 
Evil Dead 2. Puppet Master 5, the final chapter. Now, I believe Mr. Watson threw this one in there as a joke, yet it got five additional votes, so... I don't remember Puppet Master 5, but it must be fairly well received by some and overrated by others. I don't know. <laughs> Halloween 3. That one I can see showing up. I love it, but I can see others still having probably what most people's initial thought was where they didn't like it because no Michael Myers. Jacob's Ladder. Day of the Dead. Krampus. Krampus, man. What a great film. I did rewatch it recently around the holidays, and I gotta say... I still think very highly of it. I think my rating went went down a little bit. I didn't rate it the first time because I, I didn't see it in time for the year-end show last year. I probably would have rated it a 9 after my first viewing. But after rewatching, I was like, it, it's, it felt more like an 8 to me, which is still a solid film. And, you know, I look forward to watching it every, every year around holiday time. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. If I had to commit to a film and say it's a little overrated, this might be the one that I'd commit to. I love the film, don't get me wrong, but I have to be in the mood for it. I mean, Dennis Hopper's terrific, but otherwise there's just some parts that get annoying. Crop Top is obviously amazing, Grandpa, but, you know, there's just, I don't know. It's completely jump ship from the original, obviously, but for what it is, it's really good. I just have to be in a certain mood for it. Then we get into two controversial picks, but we have The Exorcist and The Shining. And on episode one, when Dave Z posted the question of what is your most overrated film, I didn't want to answer, but... Since I had to, I chose The Exorcist, and I chose it simply because it's been a while since I watched it, and the last time I watched it, I remember the beginning of the film to be very slow and very boring. Now, my taste in film is constantly changing, what I enjoy, what I don't enjoy, so I have a feeling when I go back and revisit The Exorcist, and I'm embarrassed to admit it's been a long time, I'll probably enjoy it more now that I have an appreciation for for build up for backstory but at the time you know I didn't want to see them digging and all that that just wasn't my thing The Shining I get it you know some people love it some people just think it's overrated maybe some people love it but don't think it's worthy of being at the top of all the lists getting all the praise all the accolades when we think about overhyped are you thinking of films overhyped because the general consensus is that people love it and i didn't or did you think it was great just not worthy of one of those labels of you know the greatest or groundbreaking or revolutionary interesting food for thought there next up on the list We have The Ring, the U.S. version. I gotta say, this is... I don't want to say the last movie, because I've seen a couple of scary movies over the last couple of years, but this movie really terrified me the first time I saw it. And I was, I guess, this came out in 2002, so I was 20, 21, 22 years old, depending on when it came out. But I was was a grown man, yet it really frightened me. Uh, Then we got House of the Devil. And we, uh, we reviewed this one, and I'm mixed on it. I enjoyed it more the second time than I thought I would, but I definitely get it. It's it's a very simplistic film. I think it is kind of confused as to whether it wants to be an homage to the 70s or 80s. And just there, there were a few things that could have been tightened up, but I do enjoy the simplicity of it. I don't need anything too complicated to be entertained. Okay. Next we have Stephen King's It, which got 12 votes, including Marco's. I like it. I liked it. <laughs> I like it. A lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of torn on what to say about it. Pennywise is one of the most terrifying clowns ever. I'm not really scared of clowns, but if I saw Pennywise, I would be. The film itself, it's, it's good. I own it. I'm glad I own it. It's been a, it's been a while since I revisited it. Revisited it. it. Jeez, I'm stroking out again. But I'll, I'll say this. I think when people think of the best Stephen King adaptations, I don't necessarily think that it is popping up at the top of the list. So I don't know that it's overrated. I think it, it gets the praise it deserves. It's a very good made-for-TV horror film. Paranormal Activity. Dave is not going to be a fan of this one. This We're now into the top six films. This one got about 16 votes. And I actually checked this one off. I don't know why I checked this one off. I actually enjoy the Paranormal Activity films. But they sort of got th- this hype around them. That, you know, to me was definitely overhyping, but at the same time, it's appealing to a new generation of horror fans. So I'm all for that. Bring in the new horror fans that are going to experience paranormal activity as their first scary film, and then let them see all the other classics and appreciate everything. I like the paranormal activity franchise. I'm not really sure why I checked it. That was my initial thought, though, as, as to why. And then we get into our top five. We got the Neon Demon. 
with 20 votes, including BC's, 20 votes for The Neon Demon, a film I gave a 10 out of 10 and was number two on my top 16 of 16. I disagree with you guys totally. I don't think it's overrated. I don't think it's overhyped. If anything, I think it's underrated because I think people are missing the depth that is there in this film. But I'll debate with you, friendly debate with you, but I won't argue with you and tell you you're wrong. Of course you're entitled to your opinion. It's not for everyone. Just like our number four film, It Follows, which had 25 votes, including Alex and Marnie. It Follows, again, one of my top films from 2015. Can't remember exactly where it fell. Maybe number, I don't, I don't even want to guess what number, but it was, it was somewhere in the top 10. Me personally, I loved it. Some people weren't on board with it. Maybe they thought it was too preachy, you know, sort of like a uh, allegory for the AIDS outbreak. It was shot very well. You know, it was set almost like it felt like an alternate world. Like you couldn't even tell when this film was taking place. The lack of technology in this film made you feel like it was set back like 20 years ago or something, 25 years ago, but I'm not completely sure about that. I mean, if it is an allegory for the AIDS epidemic, setting it 25 years ago, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, makes sense. Again, I enjoyed the film. I liked the slow burn. I enjoyed the acting. The soundtrack was phenomenal. I didn't mention for the Neon Demon, which might be one of one of my favorite soundtracks that I've ever heard. Okay, now we get into the top three. At number three, we got The Blair Witch Project with 30 votes. Now this is a film, I saw this in the cinema at the show, and I was all into the hype for this because I didn't know if I was going to see a real found footage. I thought it was real. I was probably too old to think it was, uh, to think it was real, but I still thought it was real anyway because I was naive. What year did this film come out? This film came out in the year of our Lord, 1999. I personally love the film. It's been a while since I've revisited it. I actually don't own it, so I don't know when I'm going to get around to watching it again. But it's not the original found footage film, but it gets all the accolades and all the highlights as being the found footage film. So I think, if anything, I understand the overrating and overhyping and why people put that label on this particular film. And some people just don't like it. Some people find it boring. Number two, The Witch, 31 votes. This one's a little shocking. Again, along with Neon Demon Demon being such a new movie. I mean, obviously these films are gonna get a lot of hype in the year they come out, because a lot of people are seeing them, a lot of people are praising them. But just because you didn't like them, does that mean it's overrated or overhyped? Should we wait a little while? See where it stacks up in the test of time. Five, ten years down the road, are people still saying The Witch is one of the greatest films of the 21st century? If so, then can you place a label of overhyped or overrated on it? Maybe. Me? I gave The Witch a high grade. I gave it a 9 out of 10. It was number five on my list for this year. I loved it. I can't wait to see what that director continues to do. And then the overwhelming winner with 61 votes. The Babadook. And The Babadook was very hyped up, advertised and promoted, had a big theatrical release. But what The Babadook did that I think got it the title, at least in our poll, as the most overrated or most overhyped film, was present a trailer and present the story that you were going to see in a very misleading way. I think people thought they were going to see a monster film, maybe some even thought a creature feature, when this was very much a psychological horror film. And, you know, without getting into spoilers, if any of you haven't seen it, that's one of my favorite subgenres of film is psychological horror, which is why The Invitation was my number one film of the year. So The Babadook, again, also right up there as one of my favorite films of the last, when did that come out, 2014, the last three years. I loved it, but I get it. People were misled. You saw the trailer, you're like, oh, this is gonna be scary, there's a monster, it's tormenting a mother and child, there's nothing more scarier than a mother trying to protect a child, and the whole story is completely different from what you're seeing being presented in the trailer. So, I get it, I can't commit to it. Like I said, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, The Exorcist and Hellraiser would be my three picks. And the Hellraiser would be like the franchise. Would be my three picks of films that I would consider overrated if I had to commit. Only because I have to be in a mood to watch them. And I don't necessarily think as highly as I do of them as others. So, you know, we'll see. Especially with Hellraiser coming up on episode 30. Black Christmas. I get it. I'll argue it till the day I die. I love it. I think it's a masterpiece. I don't think it's a 10 out of 10, but I think it's certainly a solid 8.5, 9. It just really captures the atmosphere and the feel of, of Christmas horror really well. You know, the whole issue with, with the killer, and I'm always looking for clues when I'm watching it. 
I haven't found anything yet, but I'll find something one day. Or come up with a way to explain why why it makes sense the way it does. But until then, let's get into some of these comments. Alright, so Mr. Lloyd, our leader. Oh brother, I can see Dave Z's vote will probably be Black Christmas. This is a tough one. That was the first post. And yeah, he was right. Dave Z did put Black Christmas as one of his votes. Josh Brown, so many great underappreciated movies and maybe even more overrated ones. And then he remarks that he tossed up a bunch on, on the list that I just went over. Jason follows up with It Follows was a masterpiece. And then we seem to have a backlash of people saying how much they disliked It Follows, followed by a bunch of people saying how much they loved It Follows, followed by Sam Edwards throwing in the comment, anyone who votes anything other than The Exorcist is wrong. So Sam evidently feels The Exorcist is overrated. Jason Lloyd, he's back here again. Day of the Dead has some of the great gore, but it's far inferior to the previous two entries. The characters weren't as well developed, and the island scene where the Jamaican is giving his speech is snoreworthy. It's a great film, just shouldn't be put in the same class as Night and Dawn. I love Day, but I definitely feel like the first two are superior to it. I don't want to say Day's inferior, because I would rate these all really high. Like I said, I would give Night a 10, and these would probably be like 9 and 8, or 9 and a half and 8 and a half, you know? like that's how highly I think of all three of those films it's not a question of me feeling that it's overrated I know George Romero is known to say the day is actually his favorite of his original dead trilogy that doesn't seem to be the general consensus among horror fans oh we got a tweet from Donald Trump posted by Dale Strom stupid witch film was very disappointing nearly empty theaters many people leaving halfway through sad and then Chris Genro replied that Trump has finally said something sensible. I won't get into any of that. Hey, I commented everyone saying fantastic responses. Mr. Watson's having trouble seeing the post now, so he's commenting, why can I only see Day of the Dead in the poll? What am I doing wrong? Okay, court psyops. Court. I was very disappointed in The Witch the first time I watched it and actually said it wasn't horror to me. I have since watched it and will recant that. There were definitely things that were missing in the theater when I saw it versus the streaming version that put that film firmly in horror for me. So Court did a patented second view Dave move and completely changed his mind. And I think that's important with films, especially when we're talking about overrated or overhyped films. Give them a second chance and then we can decide. Jerry Herring said his piece on The Witch and still sticks by the statement that it's highly overrated. Okay. It Follows has been the most overhyped in my opinion, and it was dreadful. I didn't like it at all. That's our good buddy Neil Robson. I didn't say it. I love It Follows. He thought it was dreadful. Wayne Weissnant. I didn't get all the hype for it either. See? They have the hype. The hype affected. Maybe if Wayne had saw it, like, blind, like, didn't know about it, I wonder what his opinion of the film would have been. When I say blind, I'm of course talking about without any previous knowledge of. Not blind as in... Stephen Lang in that dreadful don't breathe don't breathe it's interesting because you know it was scheduled to get a, a uh, direct VOD release and I was excited to see it because I'd read a few decent things about it then all of a sudden they pull it because it's getting all this hype and they're gonna put it in the theaters and then I see it in the theaters and I loved it and my buddy who I saw it with liked it you know it was sort of yeah it's good where I was like really diving deep into the meaning and finding it very thought-provoking and very terrifying. Yeah, so that's my thought on It Follows. Matthew Tangent comments, The Neon Demon was beautiful, but that's really all it had going for it. I thought I would enjoy it as I usually dig art house weirdo flicks, but I'd rather just watch Black Swan again, which was a great movie. Not gonna argue with that, Black Swan is a great movie. I love it, but I would recommend giving Neon Demon another watch, definitely. And then Matthew goes on to say, The Babadook was good, but that kid was almost too obnoxious to bear. And I think this is what people are missing, is that his character was supposed to be like that. His character, to me, like I always describe it, it looked like he was coming off like a six-week whiskey PCP binge. Like, he was just so stressed out, and he looked drugged out. Like, the stress he was under with everything he was having to deal with, without going too much further into the story. Don Bennett, I can't really vote on these. I like them all. Good for you, Don. And then Don replies to a comment I made and says, What a surprise. It follows and the witch close to the top. Horror fans these days disappoint the hell out of me. LOL. Obviously, he's joking around or somewhat joking around. 
Don't get disappointed. Everyone's entitled to their opinion, even if their opinion is wrong. <laughs> Just kidding. Eric Hires. Which for me, although I'm giving it another watch at the moment. He never came back to it. I wonder what he thought. Eric, you can always come back to this post and let us know what you thought. Dave Z finally jumps in. Really? All movies from the last few years? Laugh out loud. That's a laugh. I've been hearing about older movies for 20 years now that are overrated. I can't believe in such a short time people already consider putting these on a list. It's not as if people are saying these are the greatest horror movies of all time or anything. Crazy shit. Haha. I agree with him. I, I, you know, just because these are the popular hyped up films for the year because we're all talking about them and trying to get word out and concoct lists for our year end show and see as many films as we can. I feel like people are maybe taking the words of podcasters maybe a little too strong. The test of time is ultimately whether you can decide a film is overrated or not. Okay. Let's continue on. Dale Strom is back. Just from looking at the list, The Witch immediately caught my eye because I remember thinking from the ad campaign that it looked awesome, then the early reviews were glowing, I was psyched to see it, then we actually went, ugh, it's not that the movie completely lacked any merit, it had some great ideas, and I like a slow burner, but this one was too slow. I actually had more fun at The Shallows not long before that. Far as older movies go that people overrate, I would choose The Exorcist. It's a fine movie, but the way people place it on a pedestal above the likes of Psycho, Jaws, or Halloween is crazy to me. Eh, that's a fair way of putting it. You know, I don't know. If, do people put that film on a pedestal above Psycho, Jaws, or Halloween? If they do, then that would be overrating it because they all deserve to be on a pedestal, especially Psycho and Jaws. Okay, Andrew Schroyer. Psycho, Jaws, and Halloween are not even close to the same level of filmmaking and storytelling as The Exorcist. Okay, I've just been told. I've been served. You win, Mr. Schroyer. Don Lee, besides me, who thinks Halloween and Stephen King's It are overrated? Covers face from possible face punches. You got knocked the fuck out, man! It, yes, Halloween, you shut your filthy whore mouth, says Dale Strom. Shut your dirty whore mouth! Yeah, Jason then goes on to agree with it. Dale, that might have been the best comment. You shut your filthy whore mouth. But is Halloween overrated? What if Friday the 13th had come out in 1978 and Halloween had come out in 1980? Would Jason be the iconic mass killer with the whole family background story? Would Halloween be the cheaper version of what was to follow post Friday the 13th? Get what I'm saying? Is it held in such high regard because of it, its place and when it came out and what it did for the slasher genre, which is by far probably the most popular subgenre in the horror community? I mean, I still love Halloween. As a whole, I prefer the Friday franchise. I probably even prefer the Nightmare franchise. It's my least favorite franchise of the big three, Halloween. But Halloween one is, I would say, a near-perfect film, so I do think it's deserving of its place. Then again, when people crap all over Bob Clark's Black Christmas, that annoys me, because that did come before Halloween, and I know it's more of a proto-slasher, and Halloween is the official slasher, and, and really was the first huge independent horror hit. You know, let's give Black Christmas its due. Let's see, what else we got here? Don Lee comments that this post is going to ruffle some feathers. Haha. <laughs> Mr. Watson has stirred up a whole conversation around Puppet Master 5. Aaron West. Krampus was extremely disappointing when I watched it last year. I know I went in expecting a Christmas version of Trick or Treat, not the anthology part, but just the feel, and what I got was a film that fell somewhere between horror and comedy, but wasn't enough of each to really make an impression. I do plan to rewatch and perhaps go in with low expectation this time. I'll get more out of it. Also, The Witch bored me. It follows, aside from reducing the threats of its monster to nothing after the beach scene by breaking its rule and having it so easy to stop it getting you, just put a chair in front of your door. It was really good otherwise, and I did like the film as a whole. In The Babadook, the kid was annoying as shit. I watched The Neon Demon last night and loved it and understood the messages it was saying, and it was just gorgeous to look and listen to. Okay, it's a mixed bag with Aaron, but in terms of Krampus and comparing it to Trick or Treat, I, I felt like it was it was similar in tone for me. I felt like it, it had its dark elements and dark storytelling, and yet still some lighthearted feel to it, even though it's dealing with some darker subject matter. Maybe a little bit too much comic relief thrown in it, and I'm not I'm not saying that's a bad thing because I'm about the comedy. I like comedy. So I get why people say, you know, maybe a little less comedy with Krampus, but I didn't think that any particular comedy in the film shifted the tone of the film because I thought the comedy was present throughout. Aaron West goes on to add that Texas Chainsaw 2 was embarrassing, to which Itai Guberman 
added, if it's not up there, you should add it. And then he replies, okay, I added it. It was a piece of garbage. Wow. Casey Bates, Mr. Bates, Master Bates, uh, Mr. Bates. We'll, we'll stick with Mr. Bates. Read the comments just to see who added Puppet Master 5. Ha ha ha. Oh, Watson, you scallywag. James Caux, my Finnish friend. I added The Ring, the US version. There are a lot of weak points to that movie that I feel aren't always addressed. It's not a bad movie, just not as good as it's made out to be, in my humble opinion. Bill Castanelli, The Babadook, because I was expecting a movie about a monster which ate children. Instead, I got a psychological drama with one annoying as fuck kid. There you have it. Bill just confirmed what I was talking about before, that he was expecting a complete different movie. He then goes on to talk about House of the Devil and because other than the one cool gunshot to the face it was a tepid mess of a girl dancing around a house for a half hour and a very predictable ending. Plus the movie couldn't decide if it wanted to be an homage to the 80s or 70s. Okay so again <laughs> my thoughts exactly on that with the homage part. I like the dancing part. She's cute so I didn't mind watching her dance. I like the music and all that. The predictability. Don't mind it. To each his own. BC is the man. Jerry Esposito replies to say nothing of the plot stolen from the wicker man sprinkled with rosemary's baby bill replies exactly what both me and the wife said when we watched it stolen from wicker man and rosemary's babies now rosemary's baby not rosemary's babies that's the sequel yeah wicker man and rosemary's baby fantastic film obviously we reviewed rosemary's baby that's a 10 out of 10 and bill bill added a lot thanks for the participation of everybody myron schmidt i just didn't care for kubrick's the shining and there's bill again neither did my wife craig misery try the made for tv miniseries it is excellent and follows the book very closely interesting Matthew's back. The original Hills Have Eyes. Everyone always talked it up. I couldn't stand it at all. I like the original Hills Have Eyes. The remake is phenomenal, though. I actually might like the remake better than the original. In fact, I think I do. In fact, I think that's a popular opinion. Let me know if I'm wrong on that. Okay, Bill's back. Bill must have been available this time when I posted this, because he's every other comment. People talk about Jacob's Ladder like it wasn't a weird, boring, and predictable ripoff of Carnival of Souls. Interesting. Two films that I love. Two films that I want to revisit very soon, because it's been a while so i'm gonna keep that in mind maybe i'll double feature these two okay dave z i really like to love 90 percent of what i've watched on this list so funny i really like to love 90 percent of what i watched on this list huh that sounds funny i think dave might have been stroking out when he wrote this post i always appreciate feedback from the boss man top of the wops court replies yeah i totally agree it's funny how tastes are so vastly different with people and that's the beauty of the horror community isn't it we all have such drastically different tastes and that's awesome yet we can come together in community form have a friendly debate about why we love films why we don't love certain films and all is well and peace and harmony remains jason lloyd i think i like every one of them but a few i think are overrated which few jason come on man court that's definitely the strange thing about the particular poll most of the picks to me are good flicks and i am surprised people dislike right there with you chris general replies just because i think a film is overrated doesn't mean we don't like the film I put Evil Dead 2 on the list, and I love it, but people talk about it like it's the greatest film ever made. That's true. I love Evil Dead 2, but people do talk about it like it's the greatest film ever made. And honestly, it's a matter of opinion to say it's the greatest film ever made, but I personally don't feel it. It is. I get what you're saying, Chris. Court then responds, I get that, though. It's more about overhype. I don't disagree that some of the fandom and fervor over some of these is undeserved. I put the Babadook on, and I don't hate it, but I also think that it's not that great of a film. The use of dislike is probably incorrect. Wow. Got a lot more comments to go through. I'm going to try to speed this up a little so as not to bore everybody for like six hours just reading responses. But I want to make sure everybody who posted at least gets a shout out on here. Okay, Craig Misery comments that the Neon Demon is the equivalent of a 12-year-old who wrote an art house film. Okay, don't agree, but that's Mr. Misery's opinion. And he's entitled to it. Travis Desmond, Paranormal Activity, overrated as hell. Not sure what everyone sees in it. The Ring is overrated too, but still good. Once again, there I am, thanking everyone for their responses. Eric, Eric Danowski, my boy Eric. Of course, everyone is entitled to their own opinion, no matter how wrong it is, but as far as hype goes, I feel there are different types of threshold. A national, making millions of dollars type of hype, and a more underground, independent film type of hype. So on a national scale of the movies that highly disappointed me, my top three, are the original Blair Witch, Paranormal Activity, and Saw. <gasps> Saw. How dare you? Hey, Eric, I want to play a game. I want to play a game. That was a terrible jigsaw. In the more underground film fan world, my top three selections are Cella Tersaker, Eraserhead, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2. Chainsaw 2 is more national than underground, but still falls in the underground hype world because millions of people aren't 
praising it, but some of the super horror film fans go nuts about it, and I think it makes no sense. Anyways, on another note, Neon Demon, The Witch, and The Babadook are all too new to even be considered overhyped overrated and are all awesome films neon demon and the witch get better with every viewing i agree so for those of you that think these are terrible films i highly recommend giving them another look and further legendary films halloween the original texas chainsaw massacre and the shining don't even belong here as these are among three of the greatest horror films of all time that inspired so many films to even be created and heck this group might not even exist if it weren't for the power of those films but yeah this poll just shows how different everyone's mind can work no matter how how wrong they can be. Laughing out loud. Peace. Yeah, so I made the point about Halloween and what if it came out in Friday's spot and Friday had come out in Halloween spot. I don't know if there's much merit to that argument. I think Halloween gets all of its major praise for being a pioneer. Whereas if this film was released today, would it hold up? Not by John Carpenter, by someone else. Same film, though. Just an interesting thought. I definitely agree with him on Eraserhead, although I'm guilty of only seeing it once, but man, I was not a fan of it. I was bored by it. I was distracted and born... I'm born. Distracted and born. I was distracted being born. Yeah. I was zero years old. I was being born. That's why I couldn't watch it. I couldn't focus. I was I was fucking goo. Uh no, but I was I was distracted and I was bored by it. I do have to give it another watch. Donna Nelly. Donna Nelly, recent winner of one of our contests. The Exorcist and The Shining spring to mind, but still nothing is more overrated than The Blair Witch Project. Aaron Jim, I feel this way about the ring. I saw it as a teenager and everyone at my high school said it was the scariest film they'd ever seen. Just wasn't my cup of tea. Hmm. Side note, Aaron doesn't even drink tea. I'm just kidding. I don't know if that's true or not. That's funny because I saw The Ring, like I said, at 22 years of age and it scared the shit out of me. Paul Stevenson. I only watched Baba Duke once, but I didn't like it. I'm not into most of the creep factor slow burn stuff, though, so I think the hype made me think it was going to be amazing. But for me, it wasn't anything special. I haven't seen The Witch, but I feel like I'm going to have a similar reaction. All right, so maybe Paul will actually wind up liking The Witch because he's already thinking it's shit in his head before he goes to see it. But Aaron confirms with Paul that he thinks he won't like it because The Witch is a very slow burn. Dave Z, the man Mrs. Z is back. Man, it's so weird how I don't consider The Babadook and The Witch to be slow burns. I don't either. Black Christmas and The Prowler move much slower to me. Maybe it's because something is engaging to me during every scene in the artsy movies, but when slashers are slow, they just bore me. It's crazy how some things are pleasing to the senses for some, but not for others. An interesting thought. Matthew T, he's back. I agree with you. With art house movies, you should know what you're getting into. With slashers, they are usually faster paced. I didn't find The Witch or Babadook too slow. I did, however, despise that damn kid in the Babadook. Come on, he's no Alan from Return to Sleepaway Camp or no Bob from House by the Cemetery, so let's cut this kid a break. I actually thought he did a fantastic job. Aaron Jim, I enjoyed parts of The Witch. My main issue is that it was very visually dark. The lighting killed it for me. Maybe I should give it another shot. You definitely should. I'm sure by now you have, as this post is about two and a half, three weeks old. And if you haven't, definitely do so, because I thought the lighting of the film was fantastic. I love the darkness to it. It really adds to the tone. You know, Mr. Z's thoughts on it, and Christian's as well. Dave Z. Well, the kid definitely got his job done in the Babadook. He's meant to be annoying. Right on, Dave. That's what I've been saying. Matthew T. Yeah, I know. It was intentional. It was just a bit much. <laughs> Brad Ryder. For me, it's parabormal craptivity. <laughs> parabormal craptivity. <laughs> That's funny. Nothing happens. It's two morons talking and arguing for most of the movie. Then something moves. Then when you're already bored to tears, something actually happens, but it's nothing exciting. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that, Brad. Many people, I think, feel that way with the Paranormal Activity films. Andrew's back. This post is depressing, lol. Not sure how much of any of these could be considered overrated. Sam is back. Exorcist is overrated because it's a drag. There are some really intense moments, but it's not a 10 out of 10 or even a 9 out of 10 film. Hmm. All right, interested to see what Sam would grade it. I think if I had to grade it right now, and it's been a while since I've seen it, I'd probably give it that eight to eight and a half range. Could go up, could go down. Again, it was one of the few that I committed to saying was a little overhyped in my opinion. Or overrated, I should say, not overhyped. Overrated. Andrew Schroyer, because it's not a horror film, hands down the greatest film of all time, but should not be considered a horror film. I don't know how that makes any sense. The Exorcist isn't a horror film? I'm trying to wrap my brain around that. Nope, can't do it. It's a horror film. Sam Edwards, Exorcist 3 is better than the original. Interestingly enough, I did buy, I sh let me say, I was gifted the Exorcist 3 Scream Factory Edition as a uh, 
holiday gift. Thank you, Brett, for that. And we are actually planning on watching it tomorrow. I'm recording this on a Friday, and we are going to watch it tomorrow, which is Saturday. Yeah, days of the week are still going in that order, I'm pretty sure. So, yeah. Jason Lloyd is back. Day of the Dead is an 8.5 out of 10 tops, and not a 10 out of 10, as some people claim. 10 out of 10, as some people claim. Some people might mean Derek. I know Derek loves to give 10s. My boy D. I'm just messing with you. Body bags for life. Sam Edwards, I'd say a 9, but it's definitely no 10 out of 10. Dawn is the superior film, in my opinion. Okay, Andy Usury. I added H2O. I thought it was trying too hard to be a scream clone, and I didn't like Michael's look. You can see his eyes through the mask. And LL Cool J's humor fell flat. I always thought the ladies love Cool James. Ryan Bratton. I don't care for any Halloween movie past three. Yeah, I think a lot of people feel that way. Don Bennett. Take that, you haters of great horror. I added Don't Breathe. I didn't dislike the film. I was completely involved until the dog in the car scene, which took me out of it. It just went too Hollywood for me at that point. Well, for Exploding Heads listeners, you know, Don't Breathe fell flat for Christian and I. Dave was very high on it. I don't think it's a terrible film. But again, it felt like a been there, done that. And, you know, when I say that, people say, well, what have you seen that's like it? And honestly, nothing really comes to mind, but it just didn't feel like it offered anything new to me or anything new and exciting for me. So for me, it wasn't as great. But again, it was only a one-time watch. I will give it a second watch. Neil Lemoy, The Witch. Yawn. Mm-hmm. Ah, that's a lot of ends. Yeah, so he thought it was a yawn. Ryan Bratton agrees 100%, followed by Don Bennett disagreeing 100%. Alex Harrow, don't breathe suck. Simple statement. Court's wife agrees with that. Alex now likes Court's wife. Alex then goes on to comment, Really? Blair Witch Project is considered overrated? Everyone hates it now? It's underrated in my opinion. Interesting he brings that up because that's another film that shows up on underrated lists as well. But it also definitely shows up on overrated lists. Okay, Sean Thompson. Whoever thinks Return of the Living Dead is overrated, I never want to be your friends. LOL. You know, I grew up watching that film. That's one of the films that I watched a ton as a kid, along with House, Fright Night, Child's Play, Candyman. You know, those films will always hold a special place in my heart. Maybe I'm overrating them because of the nostalgia factor, but I personally love it. I have no no delusions that it's a 10 out of 10 or a masterpiece of horror. It's fun. I enjoy it, and it reminds me of when I was younger. So, you know, it reminds me of simpler times. So, for me, it's nostalgia. Okay, let's see. What else we got? Michael Watkins didn't like the Insidious movies. I liked all three, actually. Actually, looking forward to the fourth, I think. Dale Strom, I liked two quite a bit more than one, which was surprising. I can agree to that. Setting helped it a bit. James Caux, Annabelle. I don't think Annabelle was overhyped. I think it did well at the box office because, you know, it's a mainstream popular film, but I think amongst the horror community, at least our horror community and 22 Shots and all our fellow podcast communities, I think Annabelle was generally negatively received. I personally haven't seen it yet. Maybe I'll check it out if Annabelle 2's trailer looks good. You know, I don't want to not see it, but I haven't been in a rush to see it. Okay, then we get more Babadook talk. A lot of Babadook talk, a lot of It Follows talk. Will Wilhelm pops up. Definitely The Witch. Man, a lot of hate for The Witch. Tara Sloan. It Follows was way overhyped in my opinion. I couldn't get past the premise. Felt very Christian premarital sex will kill you to me. I couldn't get past that issue I had with it. Now that being said, visually it was stunning. Using Detroit was smart and I liked the sound and the overall cinematography. Or cinematography. Sam replies, I found it more of a message of unprotected sex because unprotected sex could potentially kill you. Tara replies, yeah, I guess. I couldn't get past the whole idea. I understand why people like it. It just wasn't for me. Completely understandable. You know, some of the films with these religious messages are a bit much for me sometimes. I didn't love Hellions because I felt like it was too preachy in its pro-abortion. Pro-abortion. Ugh, I'm getting tired. In its pro-life stance. I felt like it was boring and, and it was just really trying to drive that point home too much that it took away from the enjoyment factor. My friend Brett, we're watching Exorcist 3 together. Brandon Orlick will say I'm a broken record, but Exorcist 3 is underrated and still can scare the crap out of me. Awesome cast and screenplay. Well, Brett, I can't agree or disagree with you because I haven't seen it yet, but tomorrow night I will give you my opinion. Neil Robson will be our final poster here, and he says for a new movie, Neon Demon. Oh, and it's also not a horror. How is that not a horror film? 
That is as horrific as it comes. Young and innocent girl moves to Los Angeles seeking fame only to discover her worst nightmares. Sounds horror to me. I don't know. To each his own. Or to each her own. So again, before I get out of here, I hope you guys enjoyed listening to me rant on for X number of hours or hour and a half, however long it was. This was a lot harder. And I know I've said this a bunch of times, but this was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. I didn't think it was going to be easy, but I am much better when I have my boys with me so we can bounce ideas and make fun of each other. This felt like I'm giving a lecture and a boring lecture. Like one of those lectures I didn't enjoy going to, which was most of them. I'm no Mr. Watson, let's put it that way. This is no horror corridor. This is his less informative, less interesting third cousin on his father's side. Anyway... Shoutouts to everyone who got involved with the posts. Shoutout to all the members of the Exploding Heads group page on Facebook, all the listeners, all the Twitter followers, everyone. It's been overwhelming, the support that we've gotten over the last year plus a few months. I'm just shocked at the reception that we've gotten. I'm enjoying it. I'm loving it. I always say to Dave and Christian, as long as one person wants to hear us, we'll record every two weeks for the foreseeable future. If nobody wants to hear us, we'd still get together. We just wouldn't have to record. The fact that so many people are listening and giving positive feedback and even those who are giving constructive criticism i appreciate that too anything to make me better at this or to give us better ideas i'm always open to hearing about and remember everything i've said and everything i've read that other people have said in this show is strictly our opinions don't get upset if you want to have a discussion we can do that in a friendly peaceful manner i want to thank christian for coming up with this idea for each of us to do a solo cast so that we could put out more content during the month of january each week is going to be a new episode starting with episode 28 which was the terror train episode each week thereafter will be dave mine and christian solo cast We're very excited about what we're calling Season 2, which started with Episode 28, because we're going to be covering a lot of slashers this year. We're still going to be doing our one old, one new format for standard shows, but what we're going to do on those shows is instead of pairing up the films by theme, is our old film will be a slasher film, and our new film will be whatever's out around that time, or whatever interests us, or piques the listener's interest. This will ultimately culminate with episode 50, which will be our top 50 favorite slashers of all time, and that's a show we are all looking forward to, and we hope to get the listeners involved as well. In fact, we plan on getting the listeners involved, and we'll be doing tons of giveaways on that show. We'll be doing giveaways throughout the year. Get involved. We love nothing more than participating with you guys, whether it's in the group page, Facebook Live, whatever social media it is. It's all because of you that we continue to do this, and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Thank you so much for listening. This has been episode 29 of the Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast. The special solo cast edition, Hidden Gem Show. This is Dr. Brandon Orlick, geologist, signing off. What do you want, Mercy? Shut the hell up, you're ruining it. Ah, oh, hell, just roll the end music.